Well, that's a great song. If you think about the words to that, that's our, I know it's our second time singing that one through. So we're still learning the tune to that. Uh, there's some different variations we're working through with that, but really a great song. I want to invite you to open to Mark 2 with me this morning as we continue studying the life of Christ with the Gospel of Mark. And last Sunday, we looked at Christ's concern uh, for ministering to those in need that are often rejected or neglected in, uh, by the religious crowd. We saw him welcome the disruption as men lowered a paralytic man down through the roof, and he took time to heal him not only physically, but also spiritually. Uh, we saw him then go from there and call Levi a corrupt and hated tax collector. He called him to, to follow him, to be one of the 12 disciples, and, uh, and to join him. We also then saw him broke all of the Jewish normal religious elite protocols by going and dining uh, with the tax collectors and, and on all of that crowd there. And we heard him say to the jaw-dropped, disgusted scribes and Pharisees, as they questioned him on why he was dining with them, why he was partnering with them. And he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's calling people to repentance. And again, I reiterate, our call is to follow him and go and do likewise. Our call is we follow in the footsteps of our rabbi, if we follow in the steps of, of, of our leader, Jesus Christ, that entails that we go to those who are not as easy or necessarily or um, are the ones that we would, would fit into our mold, so to speak, of Christianity. We go to call sinners to repentance, and so we go to our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and in our town with that type of a goal and heartbeat in mind. And so again, I'm going to ask you, have you asked someone to come to Friend Day yet? It's a great opportunity to invite them out and say, would you come and join us at church on that Sunday? And then I'm going to put it back on you. Would you take them out or have them to your home and enjoy a meal with them? But uh, we're looking for the opportunity to just to reach out to our community more, and we're trying to offer you an ability to do that. Now, as we build from last week's into today's, starting in verse 18, there's definitely a sequential chronology that's taking place here. Uh, if we look at the synoptic Gospels, we find in, in Matthew 9, uh, as well as in Luke 5, that the sequence of him healing a paralytic, him calling Levi, dining with the, the tax collectors, and then the situation today of him being questioned about the fasting requirements all takes place in the exact same sequence in all of the synoptic gospels, which tells us most likely these happen all sequentially right in order. And so they're tying together a theme of thought. They're tying together some lessons for us in that. And so as we're going through that, um, the question of fasting is going to be seen this morning, and these are going together. And so as we're thinking about the point of Christ, that Christ made last time, that He's going to call sinners to repentance. He's not going to the healthy, but to those who are sick and in need of help. And we are encouraged the same way to go to those needs. The second concern or question that has to be addressed is, what is the message that we're taking what are, we, what are we trying to take people and, and bring them into? What does that look like? And so that's where we're going to be seeing as they are here in this text going to be trying to drive him towards, well, sure, Jesus, you could do that, but they need to be doing the religious ceremonies. Why aren't your people doing all of these certain things that we know is the expectations to be a good religious person? And so we got to look at what is really the message of Christianity? What is the example that Christ is going to set for us in this? And so, is Christianity a, is it classified by how you look, how you arrange your schedule, what you listen to, what you watch? Is that what classifies Christianity? 
Is Christianity based on outward confirmation that I can fit into the box and I can check off those things? Or is Christianity truly about heart transformation? Think about what Jesus called them to. I came to call sinners to repentance. Repentance is a change of the heart. It's a change that's here. It will work out into those areas. As we begin to grow with Christ and grow in Him, it'll work out into desiring Him more and changing our patterns and changing our lives and and putting away sin and putting on the new man. That'll happen. But Christianity is ultimately a change of the heart due to repentance as we reflect on Christ. And that's where, that's where the awe and grace of God that results in fullness of joy comes. But the legalistic mindset that, that drives people to Christianity being patterned after a certain checks and, and those things has been a constant struggle for the church since the beginning of the church. When Paul went around starting churches and, and introduced people to Christ through, that they, they by, by grace through faith and Christ alone could be saved, following right behind that was a group of Judaizers who would try to encourage them, okay, that's great, that's great that you have grace through faith, we're all okay with that, but in order to to maintain that, in order to secure that and keep that, you've got to also add to it these things. And they would implement back on them law. They would implement back on them religious ceremonies and traditions and say, well, you've got to also do those. That's why Paul writes in several of his letters, he writes to the Romans, he writes to the Galatians, he writes throughout, he's dealing with that, and especially in Galatians, we see in Galatians 5, he warned of this, and he says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, if you start to go back to the ceremonies, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who became circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. But you have become estranged from Christ in that way. So you have attempted to be justified by law and you have fallen from grace. Paul's saying, don't go back and say, well, this is what Christianity is. Let's keep it what it is. Let's keep it that we are freed by grace. And so that works out in so many different areas. As it practically works out, though, as legalism and ceremony and expectations is pressed upon people in various ways. Let me take you back through some scenarios. I'm going to take you back to one that actually took place about 1,800 years ago. Elizabeth Elliot actually reflects on this in her book, The Liberty of Obedience. But a young man asks, I am in earnest about forsaking the world and following Christ, but I'm puzzled about worldly things. What is it that I must forsake? This question was asked back in the second century. What's the answer? Colored clothes, for one thing. Get rid of everything in your wardrobe that is not white. Stop sleeping on a soft pillow. Sell your musical instruments and don't eat any more white bread. You cannot, if you are sincere about obeying Christ, take warm baths or shave your beard. To shave is to lie against Him who created us to attempt to improve on His work. Now we, we hear that and we think, how absurd that is. That, it, that being religious is not take, is I can't take a warm bath. Being a religious person is I can't sleep on a soft pillow. Being religious is I can't shave, I can't shave if, I, if I want to. But see, we might change though and say, well those things, we, we've adapted, those things are okay. But we set, we set new expectations, don't we? We could take this in the 21st and century and there'd be a variety of new things that would be added let me give you an example of something that happened a few years well back when i was a youth pastor in west virginia we had a young man his name was cody he was a teenager started coming into church and he would sit down and he was wearing a hat one of those knitted hats in church now every good christian knows (laughs) right you don't wear hats in church right trust me i got told even though he had parents, they came to me as a youth pastor saying, hey, why is one of the teenagers wearing a hat in church? And, and I thought, well, why don't you go ask the parents? Why are you asking me? <laughs> and, um, 
But I told, I, I told them, because everybody expected, oh, that's, that's a matter of good religious things. You, you don't do that. You show respect. I said, but did you realize that Cody has, has a, uh, a skin disease that is causing his hair to fall out in patches? He's a teenage boy, and he's terribly embarrassed by it. So the only thing he's doing right now is trying to cover that. And he's just, he's not trying to be disrespectful. He's not trying to be, you know, obstinate or rude. He just, he's just trying to handle that the best way. And later on, he ended up shaving his head and those things. But, you know, isn't that funny how we can take certain things? And, and that would be, well, that doesn't fit into the box of traditional Christianity. And on and on we could go with a variety of things. It used to be that, you know, the Christians don't ever go to a movie theater or uh, women don't ever wear slacks and, and, and all those things. And it, on and on, it, it faces, it resurfaces in new forms, different ways, and we classify good Christianity by those terms. The question is, is that the terms that Christ placed on it? Is that the terms by which we really are presented with the gospel in Jesus Christ. And so the point that I want us to see then as we're going into this is when we follow Christ and we live and do as He did, being distinct but reaching out to sinners and taking a message of repentance and grace, is, is do we associate that with, are we pressing on people a legalistic standards or on the flip side, the other side of that is uh, a, a term called antinomianism, which is simply just do whatever you want to do. There is no restrictions on you anymore. Is it, is it no restrictions or is it, is it this is the box you've got to fit into? What is the message that we're taking out to people in our society today? We know we're supposed to go. That's the commission. That's the mission of the church. Go, therefore, and disciple all nations. Make disciples of all nations. We know that we're supposed to go out and to do that. What's the message? That's where Christ is going to deal with that this morning. And to help us realize that we are taking a trans- transformational gospel to a spiritually sick. So Christ has just healed a paralytic spiritually and physically. He's welcomed the sinner Levi to follow him. He's dined with, with his sinful friends. And now he's going to be questioned about a standard that was held by the religious community as a standard for holiness. Shouldn't his followers be expected to hold that standard? Shouldn't they do this also? Well, let's see how the gospel advance continues. Let's see how this plays out and how as we pray and we daringly and actively go to the needs around us, let's see what that looks like. So let's pray together and we'll jump in the text. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. God, I thank you that you haven't left the church and the gospel and those details just up to us to make up the standards and the rules on our own. Because we have seen so many times throughout the church age how that gets corrupted and messed up. And so God, I pray that you'd help us to go back to your word, the standard of truth. We'd understand Christ's teaching. We'd understand the expectations. We'd understand the gospel properly and appropriately. So God, I pray that you would guide our time together this morning, or that you'd use my words, that they'd edify and encourage your people. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the first point I want us to see is we're going to see the accusation of Christianity's rebellion. And here's really where he, Christ is accused um, that his disciples are not doing this. And so we're told in verse 18, it says, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting And then they came and said to him, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Why are they not fitting into the mold? Why are they not doing the good religious things that we know are expected to be done? Now, when we read this, it's interesting. It says the disciples of John, in fact, Matthew 9 and verse 14 actually states that John the Baptist's disciples who ask the question, and we're kind of stunned by that. Wait a minute, I thought John the Baptist was on Christ's side. How did, how did his disciples end up over there into that, in that same category? They're, they're chumming up with the Pharisees. That doesn't seem like that's right. Well, that's a, it's a good observation. And the reality is, is not all of John the Baptist's disciples and followers 
had fully caught the idea. Not all of them were there when John baptized Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. It's been a continual struggle. In fact, over in John 3, we find that his disciples, we find the disciples of John are, are struggling with the, the rituals of purification and the different expectations, and they get upset as well because everyone is starting to go after Jesus and to follow him. And, and John basically says to them, It's okay, he must increase, but I must decrease. And so there's still a struggle. And, and the reality is, is John. Uh, was a guy who was very rigid and, 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 and had certain expectations. And that attracted a lot of people. Uh, there is a debate whether John the Baptist was of uh, a group that was down in the Judean desert area called the Essenes. The Essenes were a, were a people who were, were very much into uh, purification rituals, into all different religious duties and those things. And it was very much a very rigid system. And they dwelt down in the, Judean, in the Judean wilderness area apart from everybody. They'd kind of be like the modern day or the, the, the ancient time monks back in, in that time. And, and so John's rigidness and, and things kind of attracted some of them. And the debate is whether John himself was even out of the group of the Essenes. I don't believe he was. But so, so we have here one of John's disciples, and he's, they're asking this question. Um, the question here is, why are they expected to fast? Why, if they're expected to be, if they're going to be good leaders, religious leaders, and good religious people, why are they expected to fast, but Jesus' disciples are not doing it? That was the rule of the day. You fast. In fact, if you remember, by Jesus' time, the Pharisees had decreed that godly people fast twice a week. We remember hearing that in Luke 18 and verse 12. And it actually categorized it. The two days a week were Mondays and Thursdays. You fasted from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. If you were going to be a, a good Christian leader, a good Christian godly person, you fasted on Mondays from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and on Thursdays, twice in the week. In fact, they were so good at it that they made sure that you knew that they were doing it. They would, they, they would make sure their hair was disheveled, their clothes were disheveled. They, they would actually wa like whitewash their face so they, so they, looked, um, they, they looked down and, oh, I'm fasting today. And they wanted everybody, because I mean, what's the point of being a good religious person if nobody knows it, right? So they wanted everybody to see that they were, you know, they were really uh, on the mark. But the question is, was that what God required of godliness? Is there in the Bible a, a command, you must fast twice in the week? Is there a command in the Bible, you must fast once a month? Did you know that actually in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's only one commanded fast on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement? It's the only commanded fast. On the Day of Atonement, the people would fast. They would mourn and grieve for their sins. Now, there's other examples of fasting. There's other times we find people would fast for sometimes a day, several days, or even up to 40 days. But the only one commanded by God was on the Day of Atonement. But they had made this now into a system. If you're going to be religious... One day a year isn't really it. If you're, if you're really a religious person, you're going to do it more than one day a week. Or, one even, or more than one day a year, you're going to do it even more than one day a week. You're going to do it twice a week. Because then, you're really spiritual. Now, is that about outward confirmation or heart transformation? Was it, were they doing it because they loved God and desired Him and really going to devote themselves to Him? No. They're doing it because it was expected of the religious group. And so we find this as the accusation of Christianity's rebellion. But let's hear what Christ explains us, the explanation of Christianity's rejoicing. And Jesus is going to answer their question with a question, using a practical analogy of a wedding feast and the joy of the bridegroom and his presence to make his point which should have resounded well with John the Baptist's disciples here. Because, in fact, in that same scenario that I mentioned to you in John 3, when they were questioning all the people are going out and following Jesus, 
John had actually given the same analogy of the bridegroom. And he said in verse 29 of John 3, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. What John was saying there was, hey, the bridegroom is here. I'm, I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. And so when he's here in our presence, I get to hear his voice and my joy is fulfilled. I'm not worried about the other things. And so Jesus uses the exact same analogy. And so we'll notice, first of all, the analogy of the bridegroom's presence in verse 19. As he says to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. And so what he's talking about here is he's talking about the wedding feast, when the bridegroom would come back for the bride. And they'd have this wedding feast that traditionally would last about seven days. It's a great time of jubilation. In fact, for a a, a working hard man, this was to be the the most exciting, refreshing, and joyous week of his life. He could come to that and just enjoy those things. In fact, the, the, the rabbis had so recognized the need for joy at a wedding feast that they had made a rule that it was it was not required to follow any religious ceremonies that would hinder your joy during the wedding feast. Isn't that funny how they can make rules for things at times and they can take them back when they want at times and they could just, it was all just man-made. This whole religious system was just, well, we think now this or we think now this. But this time of the bridegroom, the point that Christ is making is when the bridegroom comes, you don't go to a wedding feast that was seven days. It was a major cultural thing. And you go in there mourning and, and grieving and fasting. It's a time of celebration because the bridegroom is there. His presence is with you. That's not a time of mourning. That's a time of rejoicing. And that's what he's trying to make here in his point. And so Jesus is making the point that he is the bridegroom to all who receive him. In fact, later, that same idea, that terminology or understanding is found in Romans 7, where the reality that we're the bride and he's the bridegroom. In Romans 7 and verse 4, therefore, my brethren, Paul says, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another to him who was raised up from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. We've been united with christ the bridegroom has come he's made us a part of him this isn't a time of mourning and rejoicing because in his presence is fullness of joy we have an opportunity through grace through the gospel to enjoy a relationship with jesus christ and so jesus is saying there to them is there they're saying wait a minute how come your guys aren't aren't fasting he says Because I'm right here. Because I'm with them. Why would you mourn and grieve when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Why would you do that? This is a time to to have joy and excitement. I was, uh, this last week I was speaking at Centercrest on Monday. And I was speaking on, uh, on my favorite psalm. Favorite sentence in my favorite psalm. Psalm 23 verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Just to think about that aspect that when I've got Jesus Christ, the Lord Jehovah as my shepherd, he calls me his and he calls me, uh, I call him mine. There's a a relationship in that. There's just such a joy in that that the, the psalmist David says, I shall not want. I don't need anything else. There's nothing else that will satisfy my needs but this shepherd, and he's mine, and I'm his, and that relationship, because that's full joy. And no matter what he leads me through, whether it's the, the, the calm green grass and, and the, cool, the cool waters, or whether it's through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He, he prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. He says, when I have When I have the shepherd, when I have Jesus Christ, I don't need anything else 
because he satisfies everything. You know what is not in Psalm 23? Any form of legalism requirements. The joy is him. The joy of Christianity, the the reality of Christianity, the reality of true religion is relationship. It's a relationship with our God that's made available through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is trying to teach them back to this. It's about me. It's about a relationship with me. This isn't a time for mourning. This is a time of rejoicing. The, The life of a Christian is not to be a funeral The church should be the happiest people on earth in spite of, no matter what the circumstances are, it's a time of joy, like a wedding feast. Because every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love Him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and He's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. That's the idea. That every day we get to have a relationship with Him. Every day we get to get up early and, and say, man, I get to talk with God today. I get to get up early and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what he says to me today. I get to have a relationship because that's where the fullness of joy comes in. And so if we start to take people with a message that says, yes, we're going to go out to every person no matter what your needs are, but you got to press us, we're going to press them in this box of legalism of do's and don'ts. You know what you'll do so fast? You'll steal every bit of joy out of their life. Because they'll say, man, what hope is this? I just took off the shackles of sin to put on the shackles of law. I don't, I don't want to exchange one shackle for another shackle. That's not the gospel. The gospel isn't shackles. The gospel is joy and freedom in Christ. By grace, we've been poured grace upon grace through Christ. And so... Christianity is a relationship of joy, and the more we walk with Him and fellowship with Him, as 1 John 1 says, there's where there's the fullness of joy. So we've seen there the, the analogy of the bridegroom's presence. He's going to make another little quick comment on this with the anticipation of the bridegroom's passion. In verse 20, we read it there, and he says, he says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. When is that? What's he talking about? Well, he does mention here a time of mourning and fasting. It was coming. And the key is what it says, when the bridegroom will be taken away. That, that term, taken away, is a pyro in the Greek, which conveys the idea of being taken away by violent force. That he, would be, he would be brutally taken away. We know when that happened. It was in the passion of Christ when He went to the cross for our sins. There was going to be a time of mourning. His disciples didn't know what to do. They went to the upper room and and, and they fasted and were were concerned when He was taken away from them like that. This isn't talking about the ascension. This is talking about the crucifixion. That will be a time of mourning. But today He is alive. And we can enjoy His presence spiritually today But we look forward to even greater when not only do we enjoy His presence spiritually, but also, again, physically. Can you imagine that? I mean, that that is the joy of the church. That that we're looking forward to that even so come Lord Jesus. I, I oftentimes just ponder and meditate on what was that like for Adam and Eve to walk with God in the garden? Can you imagine what that's like to actually enjoy the physical presence with the all-powerful Creator God? I mean, what He could show you. We, we talked today, and there's commercials about AI, artificial intelligence. I, I can imagine Him saying, yeah, let me show you about GI, God's intelligence. Let me show you how this leaf works. Oh, you want to you see how fish swim underwater, can breathe through water? Let me show you how I made them. Isn't this awesome? That is way surpasses anything that we understand or could grasp today. And, and so we are looking forward to a day when we can walk with God again physically. The joy of heaven is not the celestial city. The joy of heaven is not the golden streets. 
The joy of heaven is not even that there'll be no more sin, no more pain. The joy of heaven is him. He is the joy of heaven. And Jesus is saying, this is what it's about. This is what I want to take you back to. It's about myself. And so he's saying, basically, you've been mourning. Legalistic Judaism isn't the key here. Any form of works-based religion is completely out of touch with God's plan of salvation in our relationship with God. They were mourning through fasting when they should have been rejoicing. They were missing it. They were missing the whole foundation of what the gospel entails and brings for us. So we've seen the accusation of Christianity's rebellion. We've seen the explanation of Christianity's rejoicing. And he's going to give us two illustrations here of Christianity's replacing. Um, two illustrations that are demonstrating that the gospel he is presenting, the gospel of grace through faith, is not compatible at all with a law-based, works-based religious system. They don't even work together. They can't fit together. These are totally different. I mentioned on Easter, there's only two religions in the world. Everything either fits into a works-based me-centered, what I can do type of a, of a religious system, or there is the gospel of grace, Christianity. And the two are not compatible. You, you can't join them together. And so Christ is going to make that abundantly clear with these two illustrations. Notice the first one there in verse 21. He says, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And so we see the, the new garments. And the idea there was back in those times when they were sewing cloth together to make, to make, a, uh, uh, to make a clothing of those things, it was all hand sewn. And so it was, as, as, it was often loosely stitched together. And it took time for it as they would wash it and those things for the fibers to shrink up and to kind of become a tighter pattern. And so if you had an, an old garment, an old, you know, let's say you got your old tunic that you're wearing and it's got some holes in it, well, you wouldn't want to take a, a brand new piece of cloth that hasn't been shrunk up yet and sew that in there tightly because as soon as that starts to, the fibers shrink up, it's going to pull away from the old one and now it's going to make the tear even worse. What's he trying to emphasize here? What's the point he's making? The point that he's making here is that he didn't come with the gospel of grace to simply patch up and to fix this issue. My thing keeps moving on me here. He didn't come to fix and patch up the religious Judaism and the ceremonies and all that. He came to completely replace it. What he's bringing is not just a new patch. He's not saying, okay, great, take on me and continue the ceremonies and continue doing the, the sacrifices and all that and we'll just kind of restructurize here. No, he's saying this is all completely brand new. And so the, the old garment is not the Mosaic law or the Old Testament. What it is is, is any righteousness by my own merits. That's the, that's the old garment. Any righteousness that I've been trying to earn on my own merits. And he says, that's the old system. You're trying to earn righteousness. But I've given you a new robe of righteousness. I'm coming to give you a completely new garment. And so it's not a mixing of the old and the new. It's the fulfillment of the old and the new. Then he gives one more illustration, which is that of the, of the wineskins. He says in verse 22, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be first, must, must be put into new wineskins. And so here is the, the second illustration, that of, uh, of these wineskins. And he says, no one does this. This is obvious. You don't do this. It's the same with the old, old cloth situation there. Now, wine in biblical times was stored in containers made from animal skins, most of the time goat skins. Now, I think you're hearing that, you're saying, that's gross. I don't want to drink things out of a goat skin. Um, but here's what they would do. They would, take the, they would skin the goat by trying to make as, as least amount of cuts as possible. They would kind of put that back together, 
um, they would sew together where the feet, the, the, the legs and things were, and then they would take and they would tan that um, and dry it out, and then they would use that actually to store liquids in, a lot of times wine. Now, when you take brand new wine, which is just fresh grape juice, you put it in there and it was fine. But as the fermentation began to happen and gases were released, that would expand. And a wine skin, a, a, a goat skin, who had the flexibility, had the elasticity that it could, it could flex as it needed to. But as a skin became old and hardened and, and used up over time, then it, was, it didn't have any elasticity anymore. And so he said, nobody takes fresh wine and puts it into a, a brittle old wine skin because when the fermentation process starts to happen and it starts to expand, what it's going to do is going to crack that, that skin open and you're going to lose the skin and you're going to lose the wine and all is lost. What's the point he's making? It's the same point. The old is being replaced completely by the new. Any merit-based righteousness that's been the old system that's been pressed upon you through Judaism and all the ceremonies, that's all being replaced and it's now a relationship with Jesus Christ by grace through faith. So he's telling them as they're accusing him, hey, you're not fitting into the box. You're not having your guys fast and you're not doing that stuff. He's saying that's because there's no more need for that stuff anymore. Christianity, what I'm bringing, what Jesus said he's bringing here, is not about a legalistic do's and don'ts. It's about a relationship. It's about a heart transformation that will begin to change us on the outside. It will begin to have those outward things, but if we start making church and good Christianity as we've got to fit into that mold, you know, check the boxes off, then we've just gone back to the law. We've gone back to the old system, and Christ says, you've been estranged from Christ then. You who attempt to be justified by law, you've fallen from grace. Galatians 5, 4. Now, I want to I draw quickly then three applications. How does this work out? We want to go out to our community. We are actively and fervently praying and looking at options and opportunities to reach and meet needs in our community. I shared that with you last week. We're praying about as we see some specific needs that aren't met in our community. We're praying specifically about drug rehabilitation because there is not a good drug rehabilitation process in Belfont. We're praying earnestly about a pregnancy resource clinic. And how do we involve some sort of pregnancy care and help in Belfont? And we're praying earnestly about the need to have counseling and Bible study right in the community to those who may come with different needs and they can just come in and get some counseling to have some Bible study. And we, we're looking at how that God can move in that way. But we've got to get in our minds when we go out and reach in our community, what does that look like? What are we trying to if we're going to try to help sinners and the sick, as Jesus used the term last week, what, is the, what are we trying to make them become like? Is it so that they'll come in here and wear a suit and tie and, 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 and all that kind of stuff? Is that what we're trying to do? Because if that's what we're trying to do, we can simply hand them, here is the guidebook. Memorize this and check out these things and you're good to go. I don't believe so. It's about a relationship of joy. It's about what God can do and transform a heart. So I, I, I jotted down three applications as we're taking the gospel out to people. The first one is this. We need to recognize then that our evangelism efforts need to be winsome and biblical. Our evangelism efforts need to be winsome and biblical. And I have two thoughts with this. Sometimes we take the gospel to people and it's not received because we are so gloomy. We do not present the joy of the Lord. We don't present that, man, it is, a, it is such an awesome thing to be a Christian. Let me ask you, is it an awesome thing to be a Christian? Yeah, well, tell your face sometimes. 
so that your face can tell it to people out in the community. It ought to be winsome. I believe that Jesus Christ is winsome. I believe the gospel is winsome. I believe the relationship with Jesus Christ every day and throughout my days is winsome. That's exciting, and it's enjoyable, and it's the joy of my life. Beyond anything else in my life is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we need to present not a gloomy gospel, but man, this is a freeing, awesome, joyful thing. What Christ is doing for us. And so the other thought that I have along with this is sometimes I think we try to argue people in the kingdom. And we'll attack certain areas. Now I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that that doesn't work. And I'll tell you why it doesn't, how I know it doesn't work. Because I've tried it a lot of times. And it doesn't work. I remember when I was a, a younger Christian. I was my teen years and college years. And, and out of a... A tenacious effort I would try to reach people and I, I would use if I saw them smoking I would attack their smoking habit oh you're smoking with them cancer sticks blah, blah, blah. and I'd go on to that and I would then try to use that as my door to bring in the gospel which was stupid it never worked because why am I going to say you know uh, the gospel is a gospel of grace and Christ will save you from your sins and, and fix all it's all about grace but you got to fix this first well that's ridiculous and oftentimes that, that's what we do in our evangelism efforts. It's not biblical. We, we, we attack the fruit issues out here when Christ says, well, let me change their heart in here and let's let the Holy Spirit do the work of changing the fruit sins out there. Listen, I'm not the Holy Spirit and neither are you. And there is no deficiency in the Trinity. It never became a, a member of four. It's always just been three. And they've been fine for all of eternity. So we don't have to argue somebody and say, well, I've got to fix this, and then you can come. And so there's an there, there's a, the, the issue there. The evangelism efforts need to be winsome and biblical. And, and by the way, as I've learned and watched that those efforts never really produced salvations, and I've changed that and, and let the Holy Spirit do that work, it's funny to me. Just the other day I had somebody that tell me, that they were convicted about their smoking habit and they want to start changing that. They had gotten converted about two years ago or a year and a half ago and, and they wanted to start working that. You know what's funny is I, I never once mentioned it to them. I never once even talked about their smoking habit. And they just got convicted about it. They didn't want to be under the power of anything. They want to be freed from that. God will change lives. He'll, he'll do the work in their lives. And that's when it's a much better, beautiful thing because it's a joy of, of dependency on Christ through it as well. And so, first application is, is there. The second thought that I thought regarding this is a proper discipling or st- discipleship focus is a gospel-centered walk with God. We strive to disciple believers. And we pair them up with people and, and try to help disciple them. Our purpose, however, in discipling new believers is not so that we can show them the do's and don'ts. Our purpose in discipling believers is to help them discover more of God and to help them grow in that relationship with God in every area of their life. That's the purpose of discipling. We want them just to be more in awe of God, more in love with God, and walking with Him daily. And and we help them learn how to do that. Not that we say, well, if you're going to come to church, you've got to sit here, you've got to do this. And you've got to... That's not our purpose of our discipleship. We're not going to put them back under the, the law there and the, the restrictions. And so, um, so, thirdly then, my third application is the church needs to be a place that then reflects a gospel of grace. The church needs to be a place where we welcome and we encourage and we look for opportunities we come, we're open armed to those who may look like sinners and not church trained Christians. In fact, we ought to rejoice when the church reflects the kingdom of God with diversity, reflects the, the, the reality of, the, of what the gospel of trophies of grace have done. The church ought to be a place where it doesn't matter what the, the scars have been from your life of the past. It's just a demonstration of how powerful grace is. And so the church ought to be open-armed, welcoming those who are working through those things. And so 
Jesus tells them basically when they're questioning, why aren't you fitting in that mold? He says, because that's not the mold I came to set. Christianity has got a new mold. I mean, you go present to people what Christ can do. I'll close with this story. Many years ago in St. Louis, a lawyer visited a Christian to transact some business. Before the two parted, the client said to the lawyer, he said, I've often wanted to ask you a question, but I've been afraid to do so. To which the lawyer responded back, well, what do you want to ask me? What do you want to know? The man replied, I've wondered why you're not a Christian. The lawyer hung his head and said, I know enough about the Bible to realize that it says no drunkard can enter the kingdom of God. And you know my weakness. To which the man said, you're avoiding my question. Then the, the lawyer responded, well, truthfully, I can't recall anyone ever explaining to me how to become a Christian. Picking up a Bible, the client read some passages showing that all are under condemnation, but that Christ came to save the lost by dying the cross for their sins. He said, by receiving him as your substitute and redeemer, you can be forgiven. And if you're willing to receive Jesus, let's pray together. The lawyer agreed, and it was his turn He exclaimed, Oh, Jesus, I am a slave to drink. One of your servants has shown me how to be saved. Oh, God, forgive my sins and help me overcome the power of this terrible habit in my life. And right there he was converted. And that man's name was C.I. Schofield, who later did a Schofield reference Bible. The man didn't say, Well, let me help you fix your drinking habit. He said, I came to call sinners to repentance. The man recognized, Schofield recognized, God can save me, change my heart, and then I'll let that work out. That's the message. That's the message we're taking. Christ is in the heart transformational business, and we get to walk in joy with Him day by day. Let's pray together. Father, thank You so much for the gospel, for the good news of what we have is a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. We have boldness to enter the, into your presence before your throne. And God, help us to go out from here then and to see opportunities with our neighbors, family members, friends, co-workers as opportunities to spread joy, opportunities to spread that truth to other people. God, we thank you so much that it's, it's not about man-made religious duties that that come and go and change with the tides. But this is sure it's consistent. God, just thank you for saving us. Thank you for the gospel. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.